Greetings, and welcome to AJFF in Conversation, a presentation of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival and part of expanded virtual programming. AJFF in Conversation is presented in partnership with American Jewish Committee and made possible thanks to the generous contributions of the Helen Marie Stern Fund and other donors, community partners, volunteers, and you, our loyal audience. Become a member of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival today and help sustain AJFF during these challenging times. Thank you for your support. We can only do more of this with more of you. To learn more about our efforts to stay engaged and connected with you and our community, visit us online at AJFF.org or follow us on social. And now, the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival proudly presents our feature program. Hello, and welcome to the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival in Conversation, uh, which is a part of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival expanded virtual programming in response to COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Tomil Zvulun, and I am the general and artistic director of the Atlanta Opera. And I have the incredible honor of being invited to moderate this conversation with our esteemed guests, Moni and Boaz Yakim. Um, thank you for having us. Thank you for being here and hello to both of you. Uh, the webinar will include extended conversations with uh, our guests that will be followed uh, by questions from all of you, the audience. Uh, we invite you to submit those questions uh, via the chat, which is located at the bottom of the screens. You can submit them at any time. You don't have to wait uh, for the portion of uh, questions and answers uh, with the audience, uh, and our, our team is going to uh, filter them to us when we get to that portion of the program. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we are very happy to connect with all of you. And uh, this morning I was watching the film uh, in, in its entirety for the full time, and there is a, a quote from the film that really resonated with me, and it's something that Moni Akim uh, said, uh, being adventurous is going to places you didn't know exist. And when I watched that film, that's exactly how I felt. I didn't know that such a magical place existed. And so uh, I want to introduce you uh, to our incredible uh, guests, uh, Moni and Boaz Yakim. Hi, uh, the first question to both of you uh, is where, where are you right now? And uh, and how's it going in the world of COVID-19, where you are? My gosh. Well, it, it looks like my, my like, first of all, hello, and thanks for having us. Uh, Dad, are you there? Are you there? I'm here. Um, I'm here. <laughs> great. Um, why don't you start? Uh, I didn't hear anything. It was frozen. Oh, let, let me repeat the question. I'm sorry. Uh, Moni, okay. the, the question was, first of all, how are you doing? Where are you? And how is your world in the times of COVID-19? Well, totally changed, almost like everybody else. I'm in Tel Aviv, in Israel, and I arrived here three weeks ago. And that's a huge change because I intend to stay here after 60 years in the United States. It is and, a huge change, and we miss him a lot already. And, and Boaz, you are in New York? I'm in New York, yeah, in my apartment where I live. And, and how is New York these days? New York is sort of creaking back to life, grinding back to life bit by bit. But obviously, it's been affected very strongly um, by, by what's been going on. And, and it's a different place than it was four or five months ago. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to have uh, Israel, Tel Aviv, New York, Atlanta, which is what this trio is about. And uh, one of the reasons I was deeply moved when I watched the movie today uh, was realizing uh, Moni is how much we have in common. 
Uh, and one of the things that resonated for me as an Israeli who lives in, in America uh, is one thing that you said during the movie is that you have a dream about going back to Israel. And obviously your dream is fulfilled because now after 60 years, you're back. Uh, tell us about that. And more specifically, you know, there's a saying that uh, you can't go home again. I don't know if that's true. Do you find that to be true or how do you find it? I find that you cannot not go home again uh, because uh, as I said, it was a dream, especially when you are born in Jerusalem. It's a very, it was a very, in my time, the roots were so powerful and I did not leave Jerusalem until I left for France, you know, after my military service. So when you come from Jerusalem, you are so connected and uh, it was always, of course I had two children there and they went to school and I started a career there in uh, the United States. So things just, I went with the, I didn't plan much. I just went with the flow wherever it went and, uh, and uh, that's how I stayed for so many years. Amazing. And you've been there just for three weeks so far. That's correct. Yeah. It's not easy. It takes, it will take time to adjust, but uh, I'm patient and I would enjoy more the weather here than in New York during the winter. I, I can relate to that deeply. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, are in the movie is the story of you and Mina arriving in New York and uh, the story that y you were a chef in a restaurant uh, when you arrived? Well, I tell you what, since you talked of Mina, I want her to appear just for a brief second with me. I'll well, call her be amazing. Mina. Yeah. This is Mina. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. And Hi. I was the chef in the restaurant and she was the waitress. And you did not want to be served by me. To be served by me. <laughs> but was Bye. the food good? The question was the food good? The food was horrible because <laughs> I became a chef in half an hour. The owner called me to Brooklyn to the restaurant and said, that's how you do this. That's how you do hummus and uh, left. And I became the chef and lo and behold, one time, people asked for chicken. So I did not have chicken in my kitchen. And there was a uh, place where I could buy, ch buy chicken nearby. I ran and bought a frozen chicken. And in order for it to be cooked fast, because it took time, I threw it into the fire and it burned from the outside. And that's how Mina served it to the patron. And he tried to stick the fork in the chicken, but it was all ice inside. So that was my story of being a chef. Fantastic. Did you improve since then? Who's cooking at home? No way. I hate cooking. I don't know how to cook. And my wife cooks. She's a good, good cook. She, she's no longer the server. She is the one who cooks. I like that. That's, That's right. So in this amazing movie, uh, you, you talk about your teachers. And, and I think teachers are very important for artists, people that kind of lead you, uh, guide you to where you are. And this is really a question to, a question to both of you, because both of you are distinguished artists in your own right. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about your influences and Moni, I would specifically would love to hear more about your influences as a director, because I understand from the movie who influenced you as a mime, as an actor, from Stella Adler to Ducot. Right. Uh, but as a director, what, what, are, what are some of your influences? And then... Def definitely Stella Adler. Her script analysis just opened the door for me as a director because it brought the entire world of the theater uh, she never spoke specifically about 
uh, about an issue, but she opened it up in such a way she revealed the social structure of the place, the political structure, and, uh, and the, the kind of mentality of the people in general, of whichever play uh, we worked on. So her script analysis was definitely uh, the most, the greatest influence uh, on me as a director. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to study with Stella Adler for two years when I was a teenager. My dad, who was friends with her, convinced her to let someone as young as I was audit her classes. And, and I have to say, she was a huge influence on me, maybe more as a writer than as a director through, through that same class. Uh, I, I, you know, my dad, his generation of working with people like Etienne de Cru and Marceau and Stella Adler, it's such a, in a way, a different level of craft and, and artistry than most of us have. I mean, speaking for myself anyway, for my generation, I, I, I remember a moment when I was about to direct my first movie called Fresh. It was in the early 90s, it was in the 90s. And you know, when you make a film, you, especially when you're young, you can get kind of caught up in the fact that you're making a movie and you think you're doing this very special thing. And, and my dad was directing a play actually at Circle in the Square where he taught at the time and directed. Uh, and he did a, a play called um, Along the Long Road where he basically adapted a, a German poet called Wolfgang Borchert into a a play with only three people on the stage, three or four people, a couple of chairs as props and nothing else. And it was like probably a few weeks before I was going to start shooting. And I went and saw this piece that my dad directed with all of his experience in physical theater and using space and using bodies to create images. And I was just like, wow, I have a lot to learn. Like, I, I was just like, yeah, I'm pretty excited about making this little movie, but there are some people who have a level of craft and artistry that I don't think I'm ever going to have because I don't have the patience or the background for it. Um, and, you know, seeing my dad's work throughout the years, it's not like the kind of work that I do necessarily reflects exactly the kind of work that my dad has done. But it's always been a source of aspiration and kind of uh, inspiration in terms of what you can achieve creatively, either with a lot or a little at your, at your uh, uh, disposal. And so, you know, just to explore this further, you know, in the movie, Moni, you are, you are kind of mentoring a younger director and you talk to him about lighting. You have some ideas about how the lighting should be. And your work is so focused on the actor prepares on the character on the craft as you said itself for both of you from a visual standpoint from a technical standpoint from a bigger picture the canvas um what are the influences aesthetically uh beyond yeah. the craft of acting if you had to point Honestly, a couple of influences yeah frankly i am not very good at the technical things when i talked to him about the lighting it was in order to open up completely the project rather than try to hide because it was a very, it was clockwork, clockwork orange. Orange. And orange, yes. And he tried to, to uh, make it as direct and as powerful as possible, but it was hiding in the shadows. And I didn't like that. I felt like he should really open it up so we feel we are in it and sense the cruelty and sense the anguish and the pain of, of these young people. So it's not because I was knowledgeable as far as lighting is concerned. I, I know what I want when I see it, whether it's good or not. And that's how I can relate to the lighting designer but I'm not very good technically. For me, it's the actors, the space, and what they do in it. That's what I'm concerned with and how it relates to the story, of course, and uh, to what level I can take it. And then the rest of it, the sets and the costumes and the lighting, 
I trust people with whom I worked for years, and I keep using the same people so I know that they understand what I want, and that's what they actually give me. That's a great answer. You know, one of the, the questions that I have for you as, as somebody who's also an immigrant, uh, I, I moved to America when I was 24, uh, is the question of language. And, and language has to do with identity to, to some extent. You know, we were joking before we, we started when we were talking uh, before the show that it's gonna be strange for two Israelis to talk in, in English but it's okay because mm -hmm. we do speak English most of the time. But my question to you is, do you still think in Hebrew or in English when you're directing or what, just in life? What language do you think in? Uh, I think more in English when I direct, uh, when I work because I teach in English, I direct in English. So I think more in English, yes. I haven't directed much in Israel. I directed one show here, two shows actually. And uh, I, uh, I, I uh, was not exactly, even when I was here directing a show in Hebrew, I felt that my communication was not as, as nuanced as when I direct in English. I, I, I completely understand and it, it's, could not, could not feel more sympathy for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about Israel. Um, one of the things I found fascinating in the, in the movie was you talking a little bit about uh, your origins, your parents. Uh, your father is from Aleppo. The mother was born in Egypt. Uh, and you said, and by the way, my parents, my family is from Tunisia. So again, it's this uh, uh, Arab country. And you mentioned something that I, wanting to unpack a little bit. You said that you always felt uh, as a second class ci uh, citizen when you were growing up and being a part of the theater because everybody around you were Ashkenazim. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? You're frozen. I'm, I'm we frozen. We can hear you, Dan. Oops. Well, I'll, uh, until my dad, uh, until they figure out how to Oh, Dad, you're back. It's coming back, yeah. Okay, there you are. Moni, did you hear the question or should I repeat it? I actually heard it. Uh -huh. And the reason I said that, because we saw ourselves as second-class citizens. Uh, when I went to work, and I went to work when I was very young, I recall that I went into this room and the person who was not about to hire me, but he was sitting on the side and he was telling to those that were about to hire me, why should they take a Frank to work? And the Frank was like, excuse me at the time, the N word. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did feel that without a doubt. And we didn't have access to education as much as the others. So uh, we were not that educated, also because we didn't have the means to go to a school. We had to go to work in order to survive. So it was not, uh, it was not a totally open feeling. It was a feeling of uh, somehow that I have to behave differently. I have to sound a little bit differently in order to get a job, in order to be in the theater. The first thing when I was in the theater at the age of 14 and a half, that there was someone who took me aside and started to teach me how to speak differently, which means the way the Ashkenazis speak. He said, because you know, in theater, it doesn't sound good. It's not acceptable. And today I'm in Israel probably have the best kind of uh, pronunciation than anyone around me because of my background. I bet you do. And, and you know, the follow-up question to that, because in America, as you well know, uh, there's a great sensitivity right now about uh, racial equality. Uh, and 
in many ways, I feel like Israel has been struggling with the same issues uh, for decades. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how much Americans know about that or talk about that. But do you feel that in Israel, b- being back in Israel, things are different today than they were when you, you were growing up? I think they are different just because of the fact that uh, people are more aware of it as they are in the United States and people talk about it more openly and people protest actually. So there is a great upheaval in a way. Uh, However, I would like to say that in Israel also it was, uh, there were different immigrations along the years. There was the Moroccan one, Uh, there was after that the Russian, and each each, uh, group that came in felt at the beginning segregated and looked upon differently, and hopefully, I mean, everybody is married to everybody here, you know, but there are still some problems, like with the new immigration, with the Ethiopians, uh, which has to be resolved as well. So I would say whatever happens in America and here, it's about time for change. I like that. I like that people talk about it. I like that people are protesting against it, against racism. Uh, but I think that we have to beware of the radical people who are looking only to destroy. So it's a very, very delicate matter and it can go either way. It can go to a real, real uh, segregation and competitiveness and uh, clashes between the races or it can find the middle way where there is more equality. So it's a very dangerous time. I think the time now is pretty, pretty delicate and dangerous. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, what, one of the points in the movie that I, I had questions that I wish it was a longer movie was when you were talking about your army service and that, that time that you had in the army. Uh, and you also mentioned that you got into a conflict with your sergeant, which I, again, completely sympathize with because I served in the army and I had a sergeant I could not stand. I almost hit him too. And then, <laughs> and then you mentioned that you spent some time in jail, uh, in, in army incarceration, basically, which I did too, by the way. That's a conversation for some other time. But tell me <laughs> about that time in your life and what, how, what role did the army play in, in your in your growth as an artist? You know, an artist's material, it's the artist's life. That's where the artist draws his inspiration or her inspiration. So whatever we experience in life, whether it is positive or negative, we went through difficult times and better times, all of that is the material for our growth. So I would say that I took a lot from that, subconsciously, consciously, instinctively. Uh, So yeah, it was not a very happy time for me. At the beginning, I went into the army with great, great zeal. I was a fantastic soldier. They wanted to send me to become an officer until a guy who was practically sadist came took over uh, the unit and uh, he just did horrible things at the time. At the time that I was in the army, they used to do that. They used to be uh, horrible, horrible. And you you could not complain. Today, it's totally different. Today, everybody has a telephone. And if the sergeant raises his voice, you call your dad and say, Dad is screaming at me. And you see the dad calling back there and saying, you have no right to scream at my son. So it's a different army today. It, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, by the way, this delightful conversation between us, uh, we, we have about 
seven more minutes, I would say, and then we're going to open it to uh, the audience. If you all have questions, uh, and this is addressed to the audience, please feel free to submit them because we're going to uh, forward them to our distinguished guests. Uh, I want to ask you uh, guys about your family a little bit. So uh, growing up, Boaz, growing up in this environment with those those parents who are such theatrical animals, such animated people with a world of their own. What was it like? Well, that's a, it's a loaded question in the sense of it was such a, a big experience. You know, one of the things that was very interesting for me was that uh, because my parents were from Israel, they were rather young parents actually, and they were from Israel, they wanted me to stay culturally connected to that, that, that world. And so they sent me to actually to a, a yeshiva on the Upper West Side because it was kind of, a, which is rare, a Zionistically inclined religious environment. It was a Zionistically inclined school, but it was quite religious and our home life was not religious at all. And it was quite, you know, the kind of kids who go to school like that are quite conservative and their parents are pretty straight laced business people for the most part. So it, it was interesting because I, I was exposed to this incredibly artistic and, and somewhat bohemian environment from my parents' side where like my dad would be directing Jacques Brel and taking me to the village and sitting me down on a stool and watching them direct Jacques Brel or seeing my parents create mind pieces and so on and then go to this very religious kind of uh, conservative environment. So I always felt like this very bizarre split. It was very schizophrenic. And I was kind of embarrassed of what my parents were doing in school. And I, I, you know, I was bored about what was going on in school because what my parents was doing was so much more interesting. So, so it was a, a very interesting um, kind of duality. And as I got a little older, the other thing that, that was really quite interesting um, is that like, you know, when you're a kid growing up with your parents, they're just, they're your parents. You're arguing about whatever you're arguing about. You're mad about whatever you're mad about. There's something very prosaic about it. It's just you and your parents. But I had like, I mean, my dad would take me once in a while to see shows at Juilliard and so on. So I was exposed to that to a certain degree. But every once in a while, like my dad and I'd walk down the street or I would meet someone and my dad would say, this is my son Boaz. And people who met my dad were like, you see it in the film, his ex-students or students, people that he's worked with were like, Moni, my God, Moni. And then do you know who your father is and all this? And it was this crazy feeling of like, is he like a superhero and has like a whole different identity like outside of what I experienced? I don't know if a lot of kids experience that the way I did, where the people that, my, both my mom and my dad, the people that I experienced at home, just like a normal kid dealing with parents, and then experiencing how other people saw them, the level of influence that they had on other people, the level of reverence that other people had for my parents. And I'm just like, get away from me, you're bothering me, you know? It, it was very interesting to have this completely different perspective. And actually, only as I got older, did I really start to appreciate and understand what a legacy both of my parents were building, and how other people in the world felt about them. And finally, I got to feel that way about them too, um, seeing them from an older and more mature perspective. So it was definitely a very interesting process that way. Wow. And, and so a follow up question to that uh, was actually working on this film. Uh, which must be very personal for you. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that uh, Alma, your ex-wife, uh, shot one of my favorite moments in the, in the movie of your parents actually performing and talking about the mask and Moni saying how you fall in love with the mask, but then when you remove the mask, what's underneath is even more powerful. How, how was it? What did you discover working on this movie? Well, you know, it, it, it was very powerful for me because at first I wasn't really very involved in it at all. I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, as they say, familiarity breeds contempt. And there's no contempt, but I mean, you're just used to your parents and what they do and impressed with it or whatever. But Alma um, Harel, the brilliant Alma Harel, who was my ex-wife, although I think when we started working on this, we were already separated, but we've stayed 
best friends, and she's like my sister now and, and like my dad's unofficial daughter-in-law. Um, she was so impressed and moved by the footage that she saw that the director, Rosar Alexander, was shooting. She was the one who said, Boaz, we have to turn this into a feature. Uh, when my dad started the process of making this film, it was actually intended to be something of a legacy of his teaching techniques and so on. He never really had seen it as this entirely like holistic piece that it's become. And Razar started to put intimations of that in his uh, a presentation piece. And, and Alma was like, this has to be a feature. And so we ended up financing, co-financing, producing, getting fun funds from people and all that stuff. And, um, and I got kind of sucked more and more into it. And what really happened was that um, when it came to the editing process, finally, because Razar shot six years of footage, which is how you get to see that whole process of Alex Sharp going through his entire schooling until he goes on to Broadway and wins the Tony, which is amazing that that happened. <laughs> it was just incredible and using the techniques that my dad taught him. Um, but I ended up, in order to finish the film, I ended up sitting in the room with the editor and essentially creating the structure and, and finishing the film together. Um, and so I ended up getting drawn in ultimately and, and telling the story uh, the, way, the way it's been told. And it was sort of like the final the culmination of a life of kind of seeing bits and pieces of who my dad is and who my mom is and what kind of work they've done and seeing it and, and finally gaining an ability to embrace it fully and really see it from the inside out, so to speak. So it was very important. Yeah. Well, I, I have so many questions. I could probably pester you for another five hours, but I, I, I'm going to move now and... Uh, ask a couple of questions that arrived through the chat from our audience members. Um, first question from Sophia Wilson to you both. Um, who and what are your main sources of inspiration for your work? Do you prefer working in English or in Hebrew? Uh, did you have a very specific vision for your career? Uh, I think we answered quite a bit of that in previous uh, questions that I asked, but I think one thing that is really interesting in this question is, did you have a very specific vision for your career? My dad's frozen again. Uh, probably that that internet over there. So I'll, I'll look again. Yeah, well, you, I'll, I'll I'll answer the question first, and then you can follow up. I think what's interesting about that kind of thing. I, I think my dad would tell a very different story. But for me, as a director, as a filmmaker, as a writer, I had a vision for my career when I started out. Whatever that. Meant you know, a fantasy, right? A fantasy of what your life might be like, uh, influences people that, you know, have created, you know, work that you feel like you want to live in that world, you know, filmmakers that you feel you want to emulate, but nothing ever goes according to plan. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it is a real fantasy. You know, this whole idea that we can plan things seems to be a real fantasy. Um, look at the world we're in now, like we all had other plans, right? And now things are completely different. In some way, I, I, I feel like this has been a kind of a very painful but healthy reminder of how little we can actually control things. Um, so my career didn't go at all the way I thought it would when I started out. Um, and now for the last years, I, I don't even function under any illusion of having a plan or, uh, or trying to figure things. I just kind of go with what's happening. You know, it's the, the equivalent of kicking the can just a few feet ahead and, and, and following it as opposed to thinking that you have some kind of long, long-term goal. Yeah, it's definitely been an exercise in stoicism for all of us during this time. It's like you make plans and the fates laugh at you. But li life in general, I, I feel it's, it's like that. So I, I, you know, definitely, I'm a happier person now that I realize I, I have no control over anything. And, I just do my best in the moment and then see what happens. That is, that is fabulous. Um, so uh, it seems like we lost money for, for a little bit. Uh, let me ask you uh, another question from our audience. Uh, as a director, which choices, this is from uh, Eva Ramirez. As a director, which choices and characteristics of an actor do you find most uh, that you're drawn to for casting and working with? 
Well, obviously it depends on the role, right? I mean, each part sort of has its own demands and also on the piece, right? Because, I mean, I, I know there's some, some, some filmmakers, uh, some, uh, I, I think, did I, I, I might've just gotten an email from my dad um, about the fact that he got dropped. No, okay. Um, I, I think that different, different pieces sometimes have different styles and, and there are certain filmmakers who sort of impose one style on every, or artists in general who have a recognizable style, right? That you see, and like, I don't know, like a, a really obvious example of that in filmmaking is someone like Wes Anderson, right? Like every movie by Wes Anderson, from every set design to every costume to every actor, you feel is in a Wes Anderson movie. So- Whether that, you like it or not. Yeah, well, you I, like I, I like it, but, but, that, but that director is going to look for people who fit into that particular kind of world and can work in that in that zone for people i think like me or even not to speak for my dad where the material the choice of material tends to really create a different approach every time because we bend ourselves more to what that particular environment is or what that particular story is or a way of telling it i end up looking for different things from different people and people who can deliver different styles of acting based on um based on the material all that said i think that the ability i mean we hope for all the time is, is the ability to be truthful in whatever you do and, and and find a truthful place that can be very it can be very stylized truthful doesn't mean realistic necessarily right i, right. I think people confuse those things sometimes right like telling the truth is just sitting there and, and being very you know not at all um, but I think coming from a truthful place is what we all aspire to and, um, and what we look for in the people that we work with. Absolutely. Th there is an excellent question here that uh, is, is going for both of you. And when Moni joins us, uh, we'll pass it on to him. But how was, or how has your father son relationship been impacted by working on this film? And or was the filmmaking process impacted by your relationships? Well, I mean, the filmmaking process was impacted by our relationship just in the sense that it took such a long time and it was a challenging and long process. So I was just there and available and willing and open to do anything and everything that was needed to be done in order for us to finish the movie. Um, and the level of dedication that I guess you have when you're the son of someone like, like Moni and, and us wanting to, to really cement and represent his legacy the way he did, both, both Alma and I, um, that was there. In terms of how it affected our relationship, you know, I, I think as now that I'm an older person and in, in our later years, our ability to be friends and loving friends and all that as opposed to just the parent teacher, I mean, the parent student, the parent child relationship, it's managed to grow into like, of course, that's still there, but into a deep friendship. And working on the film allowed me to connect to my parents and I guess give something back after having gotten so much uh, creatively, artistically. I mean, aside from just what parents give kids and, and kids, the fact that I was exposed to so much art, so much creativity, um, so many ideas about how to live a creative life, how to conduct oneself in a creative environment. Um, I was exposed to that. And I mean, I'm in the family business. You know what I mean? I, I'm always kind of impressed by, by people who are, oh, there's my dad. Um, I'm always kind of impressed by people who are like, yeah, my dad okay. was a doctor and my, my mother was like a dentist <laughs> and, and I'm this great artist, you know, like, like I know artists who come from very unartistic environments and, and, and manage to become these incredible artists. And I'm always knocked out by that. Uh, I was in the family business, you know, I mean, my parents are in the theater. I, I, I moved into film. Um, so to be able to create something and help create something that paid back and that sort of um, regenerated and, and reiterated my dad's legacy and my mom's uh, was a real gift for me. That is, that is an incredible gift. Uh, 
Hi, Moni, welcome back. Uh, I ha we have another question from our audience, uh, and this is from uh, Judy Bozarth. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Can Moni share some anecdotes about training some of the actors, actresses that are well known today, challenges, surprises, et cetera? Uh, no, because I can, I can talk about the challenges of teaching a group of 18 people in the room. And when I teach them, I don't pay attention who's going to be known or a star or work, you know, I just do my best in that room and try to get the best from them. And if they are lucky and talented and capable, they go on uh, to work. Sometimes some people get become more successful in what they do, others less, others find a different type of uh, venue for their lives, uh, different vocation. So I never really pay attention uh, individually in order to groom one person to become a known actor. It never works like that. People that I knew were extremely talented, extremely capable, are today in real estate, are today opened a bar, and not necessarily in acting. And some others that I wasn't sure about became known actors. Yeah. So I learned it from experience uh, that I cannot really, that I should not focus on one person, but work with the entire group and try to get the best of each individual. I like that. Uh, there is a, a, a question from uh, Hanania Ellen, uh, who asked, uh, your movie was very inspiring for me. Uh, my question is, what has been your favorite project you've ever worked on? And I think it's a good question for both of you. And how come? Thank you. Very difficult to say because every project was my favorite project. However, the most memorable ones uh, were actually Jacques Brel, of course, you know, that became very successful, but not because it was successful, because I thought I succeeded doing from it something very special. And then the play that Boaz mentioned, uh, along the long, long road, which I did at the circle in the square with a group of actors. And the last one was Waiting for Godot that I think I found an angle that was not, that was never done before. And it turned out to be a very, very powerful production. Waiting for the Godot and Jacques Brel. Waiting it for Godot by yeah. I guess for me, I mean, and it's such a cliche to talk about the thing that you just did. Everyone's like, you know, when were you happiest? And you're like, now, you know, like the famous Barbara Walters thing. But um, I have to say with complete honesty, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I made the film that's coming out now called Aviva. And it's by far the, the best experience I've ever had I, because I financed it, it's like a giant home movie. Financed it myself. I cast it with incredible dancers and physical actors from the Batsheba Dance Company in Israel, like Bobby Jean Smith, who's an incredible dancer and choreographer, co stars in it and choreographed it. And it's a completely experimental film. It deals with sexuality and identity. But it's the first time in my life where I finally really got to work in the world that my dad and my mom have lived in for my entire life. Like I've always used elements of what my parents have done, some movements, some ideas and this, but I've worked in movies in a, in a fairly traditional way, even in the more experimental films I've done, the acting or whatever was, was you know, in this film, it's all, it's got dance, it's got physical theater, it's got theatrical experimentation, it has four actors playing two people, like it was so freeing and open. And I, I would do that all the time now if I could. It's just not a viably commercial way to work, you know, um, which is why it sucks to work in the United States as a filmmaker. Um, but I had such an incredible time making it. 
because I finally got to do the types of things that I've seen my dad and mom do their entire lives in the theater. Great, great. Uh, one more question uh, from our audience is uh, about opportunity, which I think is an important one, uh, especially um, thinking about what you said in the, in the movie, Moni, about how we don't always have opportunities. And sometimes in life, things happen by accident to us. Uh, there's a, a great question from John Wilkins. Uh, I came to acting late. Uh, I will never be in, in Juilliard. How can I access the training your students have benefited from? Uh, repeat again at the end of the question. How, I will never be in Juilliard. How can I access the training your students have benefited from if I can't be in Juilliard? If you can't be in Juilliard, not only Juilliard actors are there working. There are actors working from every school in the United States and some of them did not go to school. You don't have to be a Juilliard necessarily to become an actor. It's just that it happens so that Juilliard is a very, very extraordinary school. And uh, you know that when you go out of Juilliard, when you graduate from Juilliard, uh, you have better chances because your technique is very, very solid and powerful. And it's all based on technique. And I think that that's what they provide at Julia, that what they pay attention at, and the rigor of the work. It's a very, very rigorous, no compromising program. So uh, it's naturally that these people have uh, more of a chance to work. And the agents go see them because they're from Juilliard or whatever. But that being said, you know, I went to City College for one year on 138th Street because my grades were so bad that I couldn't get into anywhere, you know? And then I went, to, I picked back in the 80s, I picked my grades up and I went to NYU for a year, um, which then wasn't like it is now. It was sort of possible to get into. And I sold a screenplay while I was in NYU and I ended up moving out to LA. Like, we all have to find our own ways. Like, I didn't have much of a background at all like some people do, and I managed to, to figure out. And the same would go for you. I mean, like I have a good friend right now who has been You're struggling. Think again. Sorry? Um, I have a good friend right now who has been struggling in acting since the time we were young guys in LA. Like, so I've known him for 30 years or more. And He's had a crazy life, you know, he's, he's studied with all kinds of different teachers in LA. He's in his late fifties now, still kind of youthful in a way, gotten kind of sexier somehow. And he's a better actor now than he was ever. And he just got a great part in like the new P.T. Anderson movie, you know? And it, it's like, we've all got to find our own path. We all have our own journeys. I used to be jealous sometimes of seeing what, this, even though I wasn't an actor, of seeing the students at Juilliard, because you go, wow, if, if I could be in a place like that, where like they teach you like that. But it also breaks a lot of people's spirits, I have to say, you know? And there are people who just don't temperamentally fit into it that well. I, I just think everyone has to find their own path and their own journey. And I, I could not agree more with you. I absolutely agree with you. I think that in the movie, one of the things that Moni says that kind of rang with me is, you got to find a teacher. I, you know, he followed his teacher. And uh, mentors and teachers in our lives are very, very important. Um, while, while we're waiting for Moni, you know, I have a, a kind of a closing question to both of you. And I hope Moni will be back in time. I wish we could take all the questions from the audience. They're obviously very engaged because I think the movie and your personalities are so fascinating. My question to you in closing is, Boaz, if you could, you could speak to your younger version, if you could speak to your 20-year-old version, what would your advice be to Boaz, a 20-year-old Boaz? I don't know if he would listen. So I don't know that it would make, because I think anything I could say now, my dad and other people said to me back then, anyway, it's not like I have some wisdom at this age that people didn't, that I talked to back then at the time. Um, you know, 
I think one of the things that has hit me from getting older is that the amount of wisdom and the amount of growth that we make is, is so incremental and so small. I, I really feel like the only thing I know now that I didn't know then is that I'm never going to know anything. And maybe back then I thought I was going to know something someday. But other than that, there's really very little separating me now than the person I was back then. I mean, I may be a little calmer, uh, a little less reactive at moments when I need to be less reactive. But it's just small, mellowing out things that happen with age, possibly just because, you know, our hormones <laughs> go down. Like, I don't even know if it's wisdom. I might just be tired or, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like, um, I, I, I uh, so, you know, I, you know, I, there's a couple of people I would have probably said, don't sleep with her because you're going to be sorry for the rest of your life. Just, you know, avoid that or something. Um, but, uh, in, in, in terms of just growing and, and, and expanding, I think that the process is what gets us to who we are. And there's no real information that can change anything that much. That yeah. makes sense. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Uh, we lost Moni, and I, I want to give him a couple more minutes so that we can at least say goodbye. Uh, but in the meantime, let me ask one more question from our audience. And I think it's a wonderful question. It's from uh, Yolanda Shell. Uh, who is thanking Moni and Mina for all that they've done as actors. She studied with them at Stella Adler Studio, and she was at NYU decades ago. Wow. Uh, and she has a question there for you, Boaz, and it's, uh, what do you enjoy about writing, and, and what do you enjoy about directing, and is there a special project that you're working on right now? You mentioned Aviva, but if you can tell us more, a little, a bit, a little more about that, that would be great. Well, it's funny. I, I enjoy writing probably more than I enjoy directing just on an emotional level because I think ultimately I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. Um, in writing, you really are accessing your inner self in a way that is very different than when you're directing. I mean, it's a very solitary kind of experience and whoever it is that you're talking to, the characters that you're coming up with are all in your own head. Um, and uh, it, it's a very profound and very personal experience. And it, it, it can be very lonely. It's very lonely, but it can be very joyful in that particular way. What's great about directing is that you interact with other people, hopefully talented people, and you really get a lot of different perspectives and you're able to actualize something uh, in a different way. Um, obviously, being a filmmaker, if, if I was just going to be a writer, I wouldn't try and be a script writer. I, I would be a, a, a novelist or something because the script is ultimately just the blueprint for a film, you know? Um, so as much joy as I get from writing a script, you always feel, I've written like 30, 40 scripts or 50, I don't even know how many, and only a few of them, four or five have been made into films. So, you know, it's, it's a really lopsided ratio, but directing, is an interactive environment. It has the pressures of being an interactive thing that I don't always enjoy. Um, but if you're going to make films, ultimately the directing and being in that part of the process does create the finished piece that you're looking at. Um, so, you know, I enjoy the social aspect to a degree and, and the fact that you're making a finished piece that someone's going to be able to see. But in the moment, as a creative person, um, I'm, I'm happiest when I'm writing. Excellent, excellent. Well, it seems that uh, Moni is dealing with some challenges with, with Wi Fi in Israel. Tel Aviv internet challenges. Apologies. No, no worries. It's, you know, Israeli Wi Fi, from my experience, is not always uh, working. But isn't that the case about any kind of Wi Fi, as a matter of fact? Uh, I want to thank you, Boaz, uh, for the movie and for sharing those experiences with us and for sharing those thoughts. Please convey to Moni and to Mina, our, our profuse thanks and apologies that the, that the Wi-Fi didn't of work very and well. Apologies from our end. I know my dad was very happy and excited to, to talk to everyone at the, the festival. Thanks to everyone, to Tomel, and thanks to everyone at the festival for having us and, and to you for listening. Uh, if you haven't seen the film about Moni and, and Mina, I really think it's a, a very, it's, it's a beautiful insight into a, a certain type of artist and a certain type of artistic experience. So, so I hope you get to check it out. It, it really is a wonderful movie. It's a wonderful movie. And I encourage everybody to see it. 
Uh, so thank you to Boaz and to Moni, our guests. And in closing, uh, I just want to thank our audiences. Uh, you will be redirected to a survey uh, that we encourage you to fill. We'd love to hear uh, how you felt about this program. Uh, please check our website uh, to learn more about the future of the exciting programs at the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. Uh, and please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank the sponsors. Uh, the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival is a non-for-profit. We rely on the kindness of strangers. Now more than ever, non-for-profits are uh, vulnerable and we really appreciate your sponsorships and your donation. Some of those partners include Actors Express, uh, the Alliance Theater, uh, the Atlanta Opera, my company, uh, Aurora Theater, uh, Kenny Leon's True Color Theater Company, the Rialto Center for the Arts, um, and we uh, thank them profusely for their support and for all the folks that are supporting this very important organization, organization, the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. We were delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.